Welcome to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CRE PN Radio. Thanks for joining us. My name is Jay Darren Gross. This is the podcast focused on commercial real estate investment and risk management strategies. Weekly, we have conversations with commercial real estate investors and professionals who provide their experience and insight to help you grow your real estate portfolio. Today's interview is sponsored by Building Insurance and Risk. When you invest in real estate, it pays to work with a real estate investor protection specialist to protect yourself and your investment from catastrophic loss. The experts at Building Insurance and Risk focus on real estate investor protection. They provide you with multiple insurance coverage offers and a side-by-side -side coverage comparison. To learn more, go to buildinginsurancerisk.com. Today, my guest is Leonard Atlas. Leonard is with Mission Profitable, Inc. Leonard is an author, speaker, and sales trainer working with commercial real estate professionals, professionals around the world. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Leonard about the 80-20 Pareto Principle. And uh, he's got a presentation from Brooklyn to Bel Air. But first, a quick reminder. If you like our show, CREPN Radio, there are a couple things you can do to help us out. You can like, share, and subscribe. And as always, we encourage you to leave a comment. We love to hear from our listeners. Also, if you want to see how handsome our guests are, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. And while you're there, please subscribe. With that, I want to welcome my guest, Leonard Atlas. Welcome back to CREPN Radio. Thank you, Darren. It's great to be back. Appreciate the invite. Well, I'm looking forward to our talk today. Uh, before we get started, though, if you could take just a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. You know, I'd be happy to, but I actually have it depicted because, as you said, the name of today's talk is Brooklyn to Bel Air. And, and Brooklyn to Bel Air is really three things. Uh, it physically outlines my journey from Brooklyn to Bel Air. And you, you could hear the New York accent, even though I'm in L.A. for 30 years. So I, I have proof that I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, but secondarily, it's also my career transition from blue collar to white collar, which you're going to see pictorially. And more importantly to the audience, it's my ability to coach and train people to go from working hard to working smart. Now, not to say that you shouldn't work hard as well, but you got to work smart first, not hard first. And most of us, I know myself included, um, have not always had the awareness, the consciousness, the tools to work as smart as possible. And, you know, what's really fascinating, I was thinking last night, getting ready for our interview, so I think the last time you interviewed me was actually when the book came out five or six years ago. And I, my first thought was, boy, how much has changed since then in commercial real estate, right, after, after the pandemic. And then my next thought was, but how much has stayed the same? So there are certain principles that have really stayed the same about human interaction and sales and negotiation. But there are things that have just vastly changed in the world due to the pandemic and now the interest rate hikes and things like that. So uh, if you don't mind, I, I've got some slides. I can share them and show them. And my background will come out that way in a more interesting pictorial version, if that works for you. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so I'm going to just share my slides. Okay, so are you seeing the slides up on the desktop? Yep, Mission Profitable, Brooklyn to Bel Air. Yeah, and I'm, again, happy to be a guest here at your network. Um, so... We've started our, we took a two and a half year hiatus of live workshops, obviously, as the world closed down. Uh, so this past October, we were back live doing live workshops. And the fascinating thing, just uh, it was intended to be my first live event, not Zoom. And a few days before, a number of attendees said, I can't make it to LA or I have issues going on. Can you stream it on Zoom as well? And I said, really? I thought we got away from Zoom. So at the last minute, right. we accommodated and we had guests all over the country on Zoom. And it turned out to be so effective the combination, the hybrid of people in a room and people on Zoom, that we've actually arranged our next one, which is in January, I'll tell you about that, to be a hybrid. So instead of it being a last minute thing, we're offering people the opportunity to show up live in Santa Monica or on Zoom. But the reason I say that is because we do have nearly a 30 year history of talking to CRE brokers. So we know what's been the issues, but now we have a new four or five months history since COVID, since the pandemic is over. And what we have found first and foremost, is how difficult it is and getting more difficult to get in front of decision makers. You know, before the pandemic, you kind of knew they'd be on their phone somewhere, their office phone, their cell phone. 
but then when the rules changed and people working from home, you didn't know what hours were appropriate, what days were appropriate and how to find people. And I just find that more and more, and I'm especially talking about the new junior brokers and mid-level brokers in an organization, not the people that have been doing it 20 years and have long-term relationships, but the new people who are really struggling to make relationships are having an extra difficult time getting in touch with people because they're harder to find and harder to reach. Secondarily is differentiating yourself from the competition. Uh, and I wanted to share with you that as soon as um, a broker calls up and says, you know, I understand you have a lease expiration next year. They've now put themselves in a box. They've commoditized themselves and it's very hard to get out of that box. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Number three is new from post pandemic. Many prospects don't know their current space needs. With the return to work issue still being very much uh, a, a, a topic of discussion with every company and trying to figure out the hybrid and the, you know, are we gonna be all in or partially or working from home or remotely? So many brokers are telling me that their prospects and clients don't know how much space they need. And are they in the right location even? I understand there's a service out there. It's a technology and algorithm that you put in the zip codes of all your employees where they live and it tells you where your business should be located. So not only are we uh, talking about how much, how much size do I need, it's am I in the wrong place, right? So these are changes that are occurring. Um, what has not changed ever is number four, getting lied to. Prospects will lie to get free information to validate what they're doing or to learn something new that they can use with their current broker. Uh, number five is, of course, wasting time with suspects that don't become clients. You know, if we don't have a criteria how to select who's who's worthy of our time and resources, we'll just give it to everybody. And we'll spend a few minutes talking about that this morning. Having your intellectual property used against you. So we refer to that as spilling your candy in the lobby also known mm -hmm. as premature presentation. I cannot tell you how many experiences I've shared, I've had with my clients, my the brokers, who have told me they've given the secret away, they gave their concept away to the prospect in, a, in an attempt to lure them into signing an exclusive or an arrangement with them. And then they went off and implemented it without them. Yeah. So we have to be very careful balancing how much of our trade secrets and our proprietary information, our thoughts, do we give away before we're hired? And number four is, well, it's time to prospect daily because cold calling is such a long shot, but that's not a time management issue. You know, on the surface, it sounds like time management. I'm really busy. On the reality is we all know we avoid doing the things that give us dissatisfaction. If we don't enjoy prospecting because it's so unlikely that anything's going to happen and we're, we're so uncomfortable with it, we're not going to do it often. And we're never going to get to the point where we do it well because we don't do it enough. So it's not really a time management issue. Now, but because of these seven issues, one of the first things we work on with our clients is their 80-20 sales x-ray. So we actually take time and exercises to help the brokers we're working with identify their strengths and weaknesses. And one of them is something we call the sales recipe. So Darren, you've heard of the sales funnel. You know, you got to put a lot in the top to go to get it to the bottom. Well, we turned it upside down and we start with the end result. So this is based upon tens of thousands of people's input. I ask brokers to close one sale, how many presentations do you have to make? And I'm giving you the number five because we hear numbers as low as two, as much as 15, 20. So let's just take five. To close one sale, I got to make five presentations. So to get five presentations, now this is in the old days when we had appointments, not everything was, hey, just let's meet on Zoom. But to get five presentations on average, they need to have 15 appointments because a lot of people you meet with aren't ready, they aren't appropriate, it's not, you know, there are a number of reasons why an appointment does not turn into a proposal or a presentation. Carrying that forward, to get 15 appointments, typically, let's say you got to talk to 75 prospects, right? So four and five, and that's 80, 20, actually, that's one in five. And to get to 75 prospects, how many times do you have to dial a phone or email or walk into somebody? Pre-COVID, it was 10 to one ratio. When you took all sales statistics across industry and across industry averages. So not anything specific to CRE, but all industries, business to business salespeople are doing a 10 to one ratio. I suspect it's worse now, more like 15 or 20 to one. <clears throat> so let's just say this is somebody's ratio. And we're not judging it, but we're saying to close a sale, you got to start the funnel with 750 be behaviors, we call them. Emails, dials, LinkedIn's. Uh, I have a real estate guy I'm working with now in Orange County. He's back to walking buildings. And he said, there's nobody walking buildings. You do what you want anymore. It's like pre 9-11. Okay, so whatever methodology you go with, you've got to have a consciousness. How many of them do you have to do? Now, what do you do with this information? Well, the first thing I ask people is, what's your average income per deal? And once you divide that number by how many behaviors, 
you now identify what you're earning per behavior. Even though the person slams the phone down on you, even though they don't answer, even though, even, even though the email never gets responded to or bounces back, you did 750 behaviors and you made $75,000, let's just say, right? You right. can do the math and say, all right. So you, and again, I've worked with people where some of the juniors are making four, five, six dollars per behavior. And some of the senior people are making three, four, five thousand per behavior because they have a Rolodex and they're not making 750 behaviors. You know, a senior person doing this 20 years, existing clients, lots of renewals, their ratio might be two presentations equals one sale. To get to two presentations, I got to talk to five people. To talk to five people, I got to do eight behaviors, 10 behaviors, you know? So the more experienced, and that's actually good news for the younger people because they now know, oh, I'm not going to struggle forever. At some point, I'm going to break through. I'm going to have a reputation. I'm going to have a following. So the recipe is a great thing that I work with people from day one, and we use that as a benchmark and say, okay, now we're going to give you some tracking tools and let's see how you progress. Most people, I cut their recipe in half within the first year. We take away a lot of inefficiencies within the first year. Let, let me ask you on that, because I, I think that's that's critical to any kind of sales position. I mean, you, you know, you... Uh, everybody hates the call sheets and and all the record keeping from the boss or whatever the management system is. But the reality is there's a there's a strategy there, and it's to get you the reps so that you become more proficient. What do you find that it is, or are you able to identify some of the noise that you're able to cut through and minimize or, or reduce uh, and improve the the sales? Well, um, interestingly enough. Cold calling has not become the most ideal way to create business transactions in commercial real estate. I, I submit to you that 20, 30 years ago, when you and I were starting out, it was more available. There was no caller ID. There was no voicemails and technologies. You, you called the phone, you, you dialed the number, and somebody answered. And, and, yeah. and you almost, have, you know. I now put many of my clients on a 30, 60, or 90-day no cold call challenge. Depending upon their level of seniority in the company, I have them commit to me. They will not make a single cold call. They will only do warm and referral. Now, we know how powerful referral is, and I'm sure you've had tons of guests talk about the powers of referral. You are so much more likely. In fact, there, there is a statistic that we've been using. You're nine times more likely to get business out of an existing client than you are from a brand new stranger. Nine times. So while you're making nine cold calls, somebody else is calling somebody and say, hey, Charlie, you know, you know, you were satisfied with that last job we did for you. Anybody come to mind that you think you'd want to see benefit from our work? Right. And by the way, uh, I, I didn't actually discuss it in, the, in this slide deck, but how valuable is LinkedIn these days? LinkedIn is the new cold call. I, I, I get very angry at myself and others that make that go to make a cold call without person typing the person's name into LinkedIn first and seeing, oh. I can reach Charlie by calling Darren. Hey, Darren, would you do me a favor? Would you introduce us? Yeah. Why would I choose to go hard and cold as a stranger? And think about it. When you make a cold call, they're not expecting your call, strike one. Number two, they don't know who you are. So you've got two strikes up before you even open your mouth, before they even pick up the phone. And then, right. typically, and then typically what untrained salespeople say in the beginning of that cold call is their third strike. Hey, I'm calling you about your lease renewal. I'm calling you about this. I'm calling you about that. So we not, we can look at the x-ray, the sales recipe, and identify people's strengths and weaknesses and help them reduce them and eliminate them in many cases. And it's interesting because some people say too much. Some say too little. Some just say the wrong stuff. So once we become con and you know, there's a saying, I think it comes from the sports industry. Anything that can be tracked can be managed. If you don't track your behaviors, how many you're doing, how do you know how far you, how well you, you're getting? You know, um, I often use a deck of cards as an example, Darren. There are 52 cards in a deck, and you know there are four aces. So statistically, an ace should come up every 13 cards. However, the worst case scenario is it could be not until the 48th card, <laughs> right? So 49, 50, 51, it could, they could all be at the back at the end. But you know, out of those 52 cards, or let's call them 52 cold calls or whatever we're doing, there's going to be four aces. And let's call an ace a deal. In the real world, we don't know that. I take a list of 50 names. I don't know how many are real and how many are not going to real. Uh, you know, but I use 80-20, which says 80% of it is probably not real. So, but I'm, right. I'm getting ahead of my slides. 
The next question I ask people, and it's very sad that nobody knows the answer, what's your time worth an hour? Now, I, I think, Darren, you would agree with me. There is not a lawyer in this country that does not know what their hourly rate is. There is oh, not yeah. an accountant. There's not a doctor. Most professionals know what their time is worth. Now, that, that may not be how they charge, per se. They may charge a flat rate or a project fee or whatever, but they know what their time is worth. Most career, commercial real estate brokers have no clue what their time is worth. In fact, I was training a young guy in Atlanta pre-COVID, and he used to tell us, he would call CEOs and say, I'm downstairs. I can either pick you up right now, and this is a cold call, or I can go for coffee and come back in a half hour, but I've got three or four buildings to show you. And I said, now you're doing this before you ever talk to them, before you've looked at a lease, before you know anything about their situation? Yeah. So I nicknamed this guy Uber. I said, you're an Uber driver. You're not a real estate broker. You're an Uber driver. We did our training. We gave him a lot of stuff. Came back a few months later for his follow-up session. And the manager of the office said, we have to acknowledge the most improved person in the organization with sales to show it is the guy that you referred to as Uber. He's no longer Uber. And I had him come up to the front of the room and say, tell me what happened. He said, I heard you loud and clear. I started valuing my time because I was not. I, I was, like you said, I was just driving people around. I had no commitment. I had no relationship. There was no criteria. I didn't know what I was looking for. It was just a gimmick. And it would work because some guys would come down and say, okay, drive me. But it was not, I was not selling. So you've got to start with what's your time worth an hour? Next, I ask you, how many deals do you want to close a year? Because that recipe that we talked about in the previous slide, it's, it's, it's replicatable. You know, when, when um, you know, Mrs. Fields cookies, she started making them at home. So when you make cookies at home, you have a little bit of recipe and the batter and your oven and the thing. But when you go to make them professionally and commercially, it's called exploding the recipe. So your, your home batch makes 20 cookies, but now you have to make 20,000. Well, you have to explode the recipe. The same thing with selling. You got to figure out what does it take to make one sale? And then how do, how do I multiply that and replicate that? Now, it's not the same science as cooking or baking, clearly, because people are involved here, right? So just because right. it took me 65 people in the last deal doesn't mean it's going to be 65 the next deal, but it's a marker. It gives the you a road, you know, we, you know? Right. Uh, and then my last question on this page is, do you believe that you can achieve additional success without new strategies and techniques? Because we know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. So... Um, what I've shown you so far is basically what I ask individuals. The question I ask companies, executives of companies is how much time, money, and emotion annually do you invest or spend chasing business that never closes? And I want to give you the answer of two clients that have engaged me many years ago. A mid-sized commercial real estate company that had offices all over the country, but they were not one of the big three, said we spend between five and $6 million presenting and proposing and chasing business that does not close. If you helped us just reduce that, that'd be a real value. And mm -hmm. the next company is a very large mechanical contractor, an HVAC company, that when they hired me, excuse me, they had 3,000 open proposals on the street that they knew most were dead because people came to them because of their, their engineering prowess and expertise. And they knew that all you had to do was call them and say, hey, I need a quote. And they'd send an engineer over. And that company was spending thousands of dollars going through blueprints and drawings and analysis and stuff and sending a proposal, never following up. So a lot of companies often bring us in to install a sales culture. And the sales culture is about consciousness and what are we doing? So when a company acknowledges they're spending five or six million a year, when a company says we got 3,000 proposals, when somebody sees their recipe is way out of whack, they often say there's got to be a better way to do sales than traditional mainstream sales, right? How do you work smarter and not just harder? That's the eternal question. And that's really where we get into the meat of this presentation, because that's what I refer to as Brooklyn to Bel Air. Now, you on the slide on the screen, you see two images. Brooklyn is on the left. Bel Air is on the right. You can hear from my accent. I'm from New York. I'm from Brooklyn. But I've been in L.A. 30 years. Just can't get rid of the Brooklyn accent. So Brooklyn to Bel Air is really, as I said to you, it's my physical journey cross country. It's also my metaphorical journey from blue collar to white collar, as you'll hear about now, but it's also what I teach my clients about going from working hard to working smart. So real quick, biographically, I was born into a family owned business. Atlas Floral Decorators was started in 1945, 20 years before I was born. 
And my father immediately became the Plaza Hotel Flores and the Pierre Hotel Flores. And you can see on the left, it was a very large floral decorated company. For, for a couple of decades, it was the biggest one in the country, doing over 100 floral decorations a night in the New York Tri-State area. Wow. On the right, that, that's me, a young 18, 19 year old on a ladder, 100 degree weather on a rooftop of a building, getting ready to do a wedding gazebo. Everything I did was with ladders and tools. Everything I did was ladders and tools. At the ripe old age of 23, being the youngest of the second generation, we agreed to part company and I left my family business, which was mainly private parties. And I started my own company, Leonard Atlas Laurel Productions. And the most marquee client I got was Madison Square Garden wow. for Christmas, for Christmas. So this photograph shows you 38 birch trees that surrounded the building. Anybody was familiar with Madison Square Garden? They, they've since been removed recently, but there used to be 38 birch trees. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the rules were you can only install the lights from 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. So this is Thanksgiving week. It's cold as you could imagine, windy, and you're outside on ladders and scaffolds and cherry pickers. You want to wear gloves because it's damn cold, but you can't wear gloves because then you can't twine the lights. It was miserable, miserable work, but it looks amazing. Well, finally, we got done with the outside, and they said, do the inside. So on the left is Penn Plaza. That's a 25-foot Christmas tree. Now, you know, how many times have you walked past the Christmas tree and said, oh, that's lovely. That's beautiful. Did you ever think about the person that had it decorated 25 feet up in the air on a ladder or a scaffold? Now, yeah. the picture on the right is, right? You never did. The picture on the right was life-defining to me. That's the inside of Madison Square Garden. It was the second year I decorated it for Christmas. And we agreed that we were going to hang 18 oversized Christmas ornaments. I was the first person to ever do two and three foot size ornaments. Now you see many decorations, but I suspended them from the ceiling illuminated. Right now you see three balls hung, three ornaments hung. When I did the 18th one, it was the end of the day. I was exhausted. I was 43 feet up in the cherry picker and I electrocuted myself. Oh my God. And my guys pulled me down on the ground. I was shivering on the ground. And I said to myself, that's it. At that time, I had recognized my dad had died 10 years earlier. So I was, it was 10 years after my dad's death. And I'm all about efficiency and effectiveness. And I did nothing. Now, now here's what I mean. Again, people think about the floral decorating industry. Oh, what a lovely industry. Flowers and weddings and parties. How beautiful. Well, they don't realize what that means. The inventory is perishable. It only lasts a few days. The clients are emotional. Having their daughter's wedding or a major event happen, very emotional. And the staff is autistic. At the time that I electrocuted myself and I said, I got to do something different. My wife and I at the time thought maybe I'll go to law school at nights because I have a mouth. I could speak. I love to articulate. I love to argue. Maybe I'll go to law school. And then a friend of mine was going to school at Cornell. Coincidentally, uh, with no, uh, with no um, provocation, asked me if I knew about Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule. And I'd never heard of it. This was in the late 80s. Pareto's principle specifically says, concentrate on the vital few, ignore, delegate, or delay the trivial many. That was from 1906. Now, interestingly, it actually developed because of real estate. Pareto determined the very first use of 80-20 was 80% 80 of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the landowners. And then he went on to find 80% of the crops were grown on 20% of the farms. And that's how 80-20 happened. Now, today, we use 80-20 in every aspect of life. What do I mean? 80% of the time we wear 20% of our wardrobe. 80% right. of, <laughs> of the stains in your carpet are in 20% of the areas, right? There's right. no stain under the couch. Right. <clears throat> so back in the late 80s, after I electrocuted myself, I started asking myself, how does this thing apply to sales? So I took this economics principle and dragged it into the sales world. And I found a few things. 80% of a company's revenue is generated by 20% of their sales team. I have a number of companies, CEOs and presidents that tell me repeatedly, I could fire half of my people, the bottom half of my sales force, and I'd never feel a bottom to a dollar to my bottom line. Wouldn't matter. 80% is generated by 20%. But how does it relate to the people listening to this call? 80% of your sales will come from 20% of your prospects. Now, that's an eye-opening experience. When you, when you learn that, it's a game changer. And what does it mean practically? It means to move from to disqualification from pre-qualification. See, right now, Darren, everybody is trying to pre-qualify. Oh, you have 10,000 feet, your lease is up in two years, you need to talk to me. 
when in fact, if they went to disqualify, they would say, look, I know you have a broker and you're probably very happy with the broker. Because that's the number one reason why people don't get hired. There's already somebody there. There's an incumbent. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not saying that people don't switch. Of course, people switch. But if you don't have that conversation early on, if you have the conversation of, oh, I know you have a lease expiration or you need something different, it's a commodity and you're going to get, you're going to lose really fast. So the two things we're going to talk about is the disqualification process, politely identifying, is there a fit here or not? Is there a big reason why this is not going to work? Because if there is, when do you want to find that out? See, everybody says to me intellectually, oh, I want to know early. But in reality, they bury their head in the sand and they say, oh, let's not deal with it. Maybe it'll go away. Yeah, I think there's always the, the you try and stoke the hope, you know, the hope that you'll win them over, kind of like ease into it as opposed to, you know, like you say, disqualify them right away. When they tell you they've been using somebody eight, nine, 10 years, unless something drastic happens, they screw up or the guy retires or whatever, what, what motivation would they have to switch? There's no problem. Why fix it? Right. 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 Okay. So alongside with the disqualification process is also treating these prospects as relationships, not transactions. So again, I said earlier, when you make the cold call and say, I know you have a lease expiring next year, you're turning it into a transaction. Rather than saying, look, I know you have a number of properties around the country, around the market, whatever. Um, and I know you're working with a broker or multiple brokers. The question is, are there any inefficiencies? Are there any areas that you wish could be improved? Would it make sense to have a second set of eyes? Would it make sense to have a plan B? When you don't start at the transaction level, you decommoditize yourself immediately. And you're starting at the relationship level. Now, you know one of the biggest frustrations that clients or tenants have about commercial real estate brokers? They only contact you a few months before the expiration. During the five or 10 years at the least, you never hear from them. They really want a relationship. They want to hear from you, whether it's quarterly or monthly or twice a year, whatever. They want to know that you're looking after me and you're checking into it. So everybody wants a relationship, but it's up to the broker to initiate it and act that way. So all of this technology, the Pareto's principle that I turned into 8020 sales helped me transition to Bel Air. So now you see me. Now, this was not Bel Air. This was actually LAX. This was the Hilton Hotel at LAX. It was my first major event in LA. And by the way, Brooklyn to Bel Air misses one little piece. I got to LA via Sydney, Australia. So I started doing training and I was hired to go to Sydney for two weeks and it turned into six months. And after six months in Australia, I came back to New York, not realizing that it was always that noisy, dirty and crowded. And I wanted to replicate Sydney in America. And that was LA. So I came to LA. And this was a, a, a weekend training I did with 1,325 people paying $85 a head. And I realized, and, and this somebody took this picture of me, I, you know, back in the day, I realized I made all that money and I didn't climb a ladder. I didn't risk my life. I didn't have any tools on. It was just my intellectual property. I was now getting paid to speak. And something else really big happened. This was my house in Bel Air. I started doing my coaching calls from the pool on the cell phone, on the cordless phone. That was when cordless phones happened. That was not cell phone, right. cordless phone. And from, I mean, think about from a lifestyle perspective, a, few, a year and a half before this, I was hanging Christmas lights outside Madison Square Garden in negative freezing weather with ice storms and rain and crazy. And my hands were cold and blistered and cut up, terrible, on ladders and scaffolds, electrocuting myself. And now I'm in an 85 degree pool making calls and coaching people from my pool. That was my moment of transition when I realized I made it from working hard to working smart. And then you could see over the last 20 years, you know, all over the world, lectures, so suits and ties, right? No, no more work clothes and work boots and tools and keys on my waist, all suits and ties and microphones, doing my presentation all over the place. And these are the kind of clients that have hired us. So if you look down the left, you'll see mainly the commercial real estate companies we work with, because there's a logic to what we're doing. We're helping you with a criteria and disqualified because you can't chase every piece of business. You can't dedicate all your emotion and your resources to everything. You've got to have a criteria, what works and what does not work. So then, as you know, because you interviewed me then, we wrote this book, What's Holding Your Sales Back? Find it, face it, and fix it. Now, this was, so Peter Farkas is an attorney who focuses on real estate. He's in New York. His, his uh, well, now he's in New York, but mine is Brooklyn to Bel Air. His is Budapest to Beverly Hills. That was his journey. We surveyed tens of thousands of people in five continents. 
and we identified the three top things that's holding back their sales. Number one, they're not talking to enough people. Pure and simple people avoid the phone because they're uncomfortable. They're not getting good results. Number two, they're often not talking to the right prospects. People would rather present to somebody low down the ladder because you know they're not the boss, but those people also can't say yes. They can only say no. So it's really self-sabotaging yourself by going too low down the ladder. And number three is they simply don't know what to say or do. And you know, Darren, I've recently been asking people, when did you learn how to sell and from whom? And how did they learn how to sell? Because I admittedly, I learned from my father and uncles and they were not sales guys. They were kids, grew up in Brooklyn, were recruited into World War II, came home and they just started doing their thing. They had no formal sales training. Most of our mentors and coaches didn't have sales training. So their skills are not necessarily transferable. Everything I teach my clients is 100% transferable. Now, having said that, sales is both an art and a science. The science are the numbers. We can look at the recipe. We can look at your numbers. But the art is your personality, whatever you add to it, right? So that's the not transferable part, but you have to find your personality. What makes you memorable? When, when your prospect is being called by 20 real estate people a month, what makes you stand out? So that's the kind of stuff we work on. Now, on the screen is a statement. People only take action for a reason, and it's their reason. That's their motivation to want to talk to you. Do you think people buy features and benefits? The reality is they don't buy the features and benefits. They buy the removal of pain or the gathering of pleasure. When you lower their rent immediately, that's giving them pleasure. When you find them a building where they could put their name on the top of the building and everybody could see it from around the, you know, from miles around Century City, that's pleasure. So people don't buy features and benefits. And, and so many salespeople are working too hard selling features and benefits when people wanted the emotional response, the gathering of pleasure or the or removal of pain. So Brooklyn to Bel Air are the big five. We have interviewed thousands of people and read tons of biographies and autobiographies. Without a doubt, the number one thing for success is the mindset. And we refer to it as abundance versus scarcity. This is the foundation. As everybody in real estate knows, you can't build a skyscraper on a sandy foundation. You need a strong concrete rebar foundation. So is true with sales. You've got to come from a mindset of abundance. And most people in commercial real estate really do have an abundant marketplace, or they can go an extra five miles or 10 miles around and make it abundant. But if you come from scarcity and you have too few people that you're calling way too often, you're not going to succeed. Number two is the behavior of consistency versus intensity. Do you know how many people share with me that they really only prospect when the deals that they're working on come to a conclusion and now the pipeline's empty and they have to start it up again? It's too late because you can have a 12, 18, 24 month lead time to get somebody ready to, to uh, take action with you. So I work with people on their daily sales and marketing number. What is that number you're going to do every single day, five days a week? It could be two behaviors, five behaviors, 10 behaviors, but the intensity thing, oh, I'm going to get real jazzed up and make hundred calls on Monday. They don't make hundred on Monday. And by Tuesday, they're making three again. So consistency over intensity. The techniques that we talk about, and I say it very briefly here, is disqualifying, as we talked about a little bit before, and probing. A number of my clients have hired me and said, you know, we've had other trainers ask questions, but nobody goes as deep as you. You're like four or five levels deep. They just ask one question, then they get into presenting. We are really probing to identify the pain that the prospect has or the pleasure they're looking for, and then help them quantify it. When they, you know, because, and a lot of these issues are not financial. So what, what, I'll give you two examples. The temperature is never right in our building. It's either too hot or too cold, but it's never the right temperature. What is that costing a company annually? Well, that may not be costing actual money out of pocket, but the employees are not happy. They're complaining. Morale is low. People don't want to come to work voluntarily, right? Another one, and we've had this sadly uh, happen often. Normally, a female employee gets accosted in the parking lot, in the building. So now the building is not safe. And now a lot of the population of the company are scared to be in the office. They're scared to park. They're scared to go to the bathroom. They're scared to go to the whatever office it is. Is that a financial cost or is that an emotional cost? And when you say to somebody, look, I know that's not financial, it's emotional, but what do you think that's costing you financially? And when they put a number on it and say, you know what, it's hard to recruit. We can't get people. And they say, it's worth a couple hundred thousand a year. They've now quantified their pain and they verbalize it out loud, which helps them take ownership of it. 
Number four is rewards. So smart goal setting. You know, yes, goal setting is very cliche, but the reality is you would never get on a journey to go cross country in your car without a map. So goal setting is like having a map. And fifth and final is patience. We live in such a situation, a society of instant gratification that we don't think beyond the short term. We don't think midterm and long term. And it is my hope, but it's also my work to help people identify what lessons did they, did they learn about their company and their industry and themselves during the pandemic that can make them less vulnerable if God forbid it happens again. If we have, excuse me, if we have another societal shutdown for another, another pandemic type thing, what would you do differently? Or would you still be you know, in the same boat you were last time? So there's a lot of material here, as you can see, right? We're working from the emotional to the physical, to the, to the financial, to the, the, to the tactical. And we normally do this in a three-day workshop. Now, 95% of our workshops are in-house. So a company hires us and we train their 20, 50, 100, 200 people in-house. But a few times a year, we do one where we fill the room. And the very next one is going to be January 24th, 25th, 26th in Santa Monica and on Zoom. It's nine to four each day. Now, I just want to share a couple of highlights, what you can expect to, uh, to learn at this workshop. First and foremost is to remove the fear of rejection permanently. When that fear of rejection is gone, you will be surprised how people start prospecting consistently because they're not afraid of it anymore. Number two, making cold call to strangers be the last resort, not the first option. And again, once I put them on a 36 to 90 day no call challenge, no cold call challenge, they often continue that because they don't need to make cold calls anymore because they realize what an asset they have in their Rolodex, their alumni list, their clientele list, getting leads from their senior brokers. Number three is shortening their sales cycle to get to the truth sooner. Because if it's going to ultimately be, we're not going to get hired on this deal, why are we going to propose? Why are we going to do a lease analysis? Why are we going to do all this hard work? Number four is decommoditizing their product or service. Now, one would say commercial real estate is not really a commodity. Some would argue it is. But I've actually worked in the deregulated energy industry where it is absolutely a commodity. When you plug that device in the electric outlet on the wall, it doesn't matter if you're getting it from the utility or from some third-party company. It's the exact same service. So why would people pay any more money for that if they can get it cheaper from somebody else? It's a commodity. Well, you'd be surprised how many reasons there are beyond price. Next is increasing the effectiveness of their prospecting because nobody wants to be ineffective. And we do that by helping them develop a daily, weekly, and monthly sales blueprint. So the published rate that you'll see is $3,000 for the workshop. We had an early registration discount that ended a month ago, but we're happy to extend that to your folks of $2,500. Now, we're also willing to make a special offer. So this video is going to be posted uh, next week. We're giving everybody an extra 24 hours. So by January 6th, if you register, and uh, that means sending me an email, you'll see the price is now $2,250. So we, that, that's the Jay Darren special price. Either call me or send me an email, atlasadmissionprofitable.com, and just write Darren's podcast, and I will send you the event PDF and you can review it. And if you want to register, you can register for either in-person or on Zoom. So that's all the, pre the slides I prepared. Um, hopefully you now have a sense of Brooklyn to Bel Air and what makes me excited to wake up every morning and teach this to people. And, and you know, I do want to share one thing with you. Just since October, since we started doing live workshops again, three commercial real estate guys that I've trained for the last 20 years have had me start working with their sons and daughters that are now adults gra graduating or graduated college already, new in their careers. And they said, you got to learn from Len Atlas and you might as well learn early in your career and not like me after 15, 20 years. That's been probably the best acknowledgement of the work I've had when senior successful real estate people have introduced me to their kids and said, teach them the right way from the get-go, would you please? So that's- uh, That's great. Congrats on, on that uh, you know, second generation uh, opportunity. That's great. Thank you. Leonard, if we, if we could, uh, there's one question I ask all of my guests, and uh, I'd like to ask you as well. Um, by day, I'm an insurance broker, and uh, you know, as such, I work with my clients to assess risk and determine what to do with the risk. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, three strategies we typically consider. We first look to see if there's a way we can avoid the risk. Uh, when that's not an option, we look to see if there's a way we can minimize the risk. And when that's not an option, we look to see if there's a way we can transfer the risk. And that's what an insurance policy is. It's a risk transfer vehicle. <clears throat> As such, I like to ask my guests if they can look at their own situation. Could be 
clients, investors, tenants, uh, the marketplace, interest rates, political, however, however you would like to frame uh, the question. Uh, but identify what you consider to be the biggest risk. And again, for clarification, while I am an insurance broker, I'm not necessarily looking for an insurance related answer. And uh, so if you're willing, I'd like to ask you, Leonard Dallas, what is the biggest risk? Just for clarification, do you mean to me or to my clients? You can frame it for your, for yourself or your clients, however, however you'd like to, to frame it. Well, I, I spent so much time thinking about my clients. So the biggest risk to my clients is wasting the two commodities that you can never get back. You can only spend, you can never get back. And that's their time and their reputations. And far too many people have confided in me that they waste so much time with the wrong people. They didn't know what disqualification looked like. They didn't know how to go about doing it tactfully and politely and not to burn the bridge. And when I say disqualification, it simply means to say to somebody, look, Charlie, this, this, this particular deal may not be the right one for us. You already got somebody on it. I'm a little late to the game, whatever. But does it make sense for us to stay in touch for future opportunities and future deals? So we're not talking about disqualifying them forever. We're just acknowledging if this current transaction, whether it's a renewal or an ex, whatever it is, if this one's already allocated and I'm too late and I'm not getting it, why would I want to invest any more time, money, and resources into it? So the time, and, and again, that awareness I help reduce once people realize what the time is worth. Because let's face it, if you're making $10 an hour, you're going to function one way. If you're making $100 an hour, you're going to function differently. And if you're $1,000 an hour, you're going to function even more differently. And you're going to delegate and you're going to have more people do other things. And you're going to stay focused on what you do to make $1,000 an hour. So time, but, but reputation as well. Reputation as well. And I'll tell you something in closing. I did a lot of interim things during COVID because there were no workshops. There was no trainings. The, that, that whole This whole industry shut down for two years, two and a half years. And I met many wonderful people. But I met a group of people that I, I, I titled as fakes, flakes, and frauds. You have no idea. Now, I, I avoided the entire PPP industry and the PPE industry. I avoided those. I was asked immediately, masks and gloves, because people know I have access to people in real estate. I want nothing to do with that at all, at all. But ultimately, I, I, I would network and broker and do things and you know make a living. And you have no idea how many fraudulent bios fraudulent documents, Photoshop documents, absolute scam artists. People would send me a link and say, look at this person. They were just convicted of fraud from another state, from another this, from another that. Uh, I had one guy who claimed to buy and sell hospitals and somebody checked it out for me. And he called me and said, this guy is wanted by the Orange County Sheriff on 89 counts of fraud. 89 counts of fraud? So I say that to you because reputation is almost worse than time. Look, you, you spend time, you can't get it back clearly. But when you burn a reputation and you can't call that person back and they tell you, never call me back, I never want to hear from you again, you know, that kind of stuff. How devastating is that? And the way to reduce and minimize that is by using 80-20 and having a, cri a set of criteria. Who are the people that are acceptable for me to engage with and work with? And I have no tolerance for fakes, flakes, or frauds. That's my own personal thing. So my risk is falsely being associated with the, with the wrong people that will waste my time, which equates to money, and damage my reputation. So I, I'm going to kind of answer it both, for both my clients and myself. Life is too short. There's too much opportunity out there. There really is too much abundance out there. Once you determine your criteria for what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, all of a sudden now you're guarding, guarding, protecting your time and your reputation. No, so I hope I'll, I hope that helps answer the question. That's perfect. I appreciate you uh, taking end of, this end of the year, this new year when we make resolutions, and right. you may want to make a resolution that says I want to guard and protect and use my time and reputation more positively in the new year than just being unconscious like I was less, you know, necessarily in the past and not thinking about it. No, so easy to do, and and uh, you know to, to to stay focused and and uh, you know. I uh, know what you're going after and what your time is worth. It's, it's uh, great stuff. Hey, Leonard, uh, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? Great question. Missionprofitable.com spelled out missionprofitable.com. I would encourage them on the front page. We have a little two minute overview video. And then on the top of the nav, on the nav bar, click on 8020 selling. 
and there's another two and a half minute video there. So it's all live excerpts of me doing workshop stuff, but you'll you'll see me instead of like this posed and you know contrived like this, it's all live footage of workshops and interviews with people and stuff like that. You can go to the testimonial page, and you'll see a video montage of clients that we've worked with that have given testimonials. So missionprofitable.com is the place. Um, all people that attend the workshop, when they register, we send them a copy of the book, What's Holding Your Sales Back. If the workshop is not a reality for you, for whatever reason, you may want to just go to Amazon and get the book. Uh, it's a good alternative. It's not the replacement, but it's an alternative. If you're not going to get to the workshop, at least get some of these principles that we've talked about today so you can work on improving yourself uh, fr from, from reading the book. But the best opportunity is when people read the book, attend the workshop, then read the book again. Now they're beginning to have spaced reinforcement and things become habit. Got it. Well, hey, Leonard, I can't say thanks enough for taking the time to talk today. Uh, I've enjoyed it, learned a lot. And uh, look forward to uh, doing it again soon. Likewise. Thank you for the opportunity. Happy New Year, everybody. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's CREPN Radio.